So welcome to the third part. We've talked about what a diagonalization of a matrix is, and we saw that it could be could be useful if you're computing powers. So it leads to these two natural questions. When is a matrix A diagonalizable? And if it is diagonalizable, how do I get my hands on both this invertible matrix P and this diagonal matrix D? So the first answer actually is, is quite nice. It's called the diagonalizational diagonalization theorem. And it tells me that A is diagonalizable if and only if A has N linearly independent eigenvectors. So you look at the eigenvectors of your matrix and you, if you can find n linearly independent of ones, then you know your matrix is diagonalizable. Okay? Now I won't prove that, but, uh, but I will prove a special case of this. Namely, if you have a n by n matrix A with n distinct, okay, n distinct eigenvalues, then A is automatically diagonalizable. And why is that? Well, it kind of follows from what we've talked about in one of our previous lectures when we talked about eigenvalues. Let's say that you have lambda 1 up to lambda n are the n distinct eigenvalues of your matrix A. Now, because these are eigenvalues, they have corresponding eigenvectors. Okay, so let v1 up, up to vn be the corresponding eigenvectors. Then as was mentioned uh, in one of the previous lectures, lectures is that when you have distinct eigenvalue, eigenvalues, their corresponding eigenvectors all have to be linearly independent. Okay, so these eigenvectors are linearly independent. Okay, and if you want to see a proof of this, this is in Theorem uh, 2, or the statement of this, is section 5.1. And you can see this statement in our discussion of section 5.1. And so actually that's enough, right? Uh, because if we have n distinct eigenvalues, we have n distinct eigenvectors, and then these, maybe I'll put it right here, these n eigenvectors are linearly independent. And because we have n linear independent eigenvectors, A is diagonalizable. So we have n linearly independent eigenvectors, so A diagonalizable. Okay, so that finishes the proof of that. So that means that whenever we're trying to do uh, an example, if we come up with n distinct eigenvalues of an n by n matrix, then yes, we can find a diagonalization. So I wanna give you a procedure. Now there, there's many steps here, so I'm actually gonna take a pause halfway through just so this particular video doesn't get too long and we'll finish it up in the last part. So what we, uh, we can tell from the diagonalization theorem, somehow uh, we're gonna have to be looking for eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And that's not surprising, right? Because the diagonal matrix contains eigenvalue information. So what I wanna do is give you an example of the procedure if there are distinct eigenvalues. So I'm starting with this matrix A and step one is to find all the eigenvalues. Okay, so we go over here and we set, we start, I've started the work to set up the uh, characteristic, uh, characteristic polynomial. So I take A minus lambda I3, there's my matrix. And then I'm gonna skip the details because I know you guys are experts at this now. Yep. So I skip the details, um, but I worked them out and the determinant or the characteristic equation for this particular matrix is two minus lambda, one minus lambda, and negative one plus lambda, okay? And so what I have here, um, make sure this is all right. Somehow this should be a negative here. 
that should be a negative. And so the eigenvalues are lambda equals 2, 1, and negative 1. And so because they're all distinct, we can proceed. Okay, so we did our first step. We got distinct eigenvalues. Now we can proceed to the next step. Now for each eigenvalue, you, we need to find an eigenvector. Okay, so let's look at the case of lambda equals two. And I've already plugged in a minus two i three. So I have this equation and I'm gonna row reduce this matrix. I'm not. I'm kind of just looking at the coefficient matrix because I'm remembering that I'm looking at a homogeneous system of equations. So row reduction gives me this as my first step. And then I can divide out by three in the second row. So I can get, ooh, I don't know why that happened. Uh, I would get one, zero, negative one, zero, one, minus one, zero, zero, zero. Let me stop right there. And then, so we look at this matrix. So x3 is a free variable. And we also see that x2 is equal to x3. And x1 is equal to x3. So that implies that x1, x2, x3 is equal to t, 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 which is equal to t is 1, 1, 1. Okay. Since we're letting x3 be equal to t be any real number. And now because of that, we can now write out what the eigenspace of our matrix is here. So our eigenspace Uh, not sorry, not our matrix, but our eigenspace of lambda equals two is all multiples of the vector one, 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 as we let t go through r. So a nicer way of writing, or uh, we can write this as the span of one, one, one. Okay, and we can just note here that this is the basis of the eigenspace. Okay, so this would actually be a good time just to take a quick pause and to give you a bit of practice in what you, I left myself lots of space here, I don't actually need it. What I want, want you to do is now find the eigenspaces for both of uh, lambda equals one and lambda equals negative one. And in particular, what I want, want you to figure out is what are the bases of these spaces? Okay, so after the short pause, we'll finish up this example and finish up today's lecture.